Hello and welcome to this news from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. Israel has stopped issuing visas to United Nations human rights workers in Palestine. This forced nine employees of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to leave Israel and the occupied territories. In February, Israel suspended its ties with the UN agency after it unveiled a list of companies working in illegal settlements in the West Bank. Israel is facing growing criticism over its expansionist plans in the area. Azerbaijan has accused the Armenian army of deliberately targeting children and educational institutions. The Azeri Foreign Ministry has called on the international community to pursue Armenia to stop such actions. Nearly 600 people have been killed since fighting broke out in the dispute in Nagorno-Karabakh region on September the 27th. India has recorded more than 63,000 COVID-19 infections in the last 24 hours, with a tally crossing 7.3 million. 895 deaths were registered across the country in a day, with a toll crossing 112,000. Meanwhile, Brazil has recorded over 700 coronavirus deaths in the last 24 hours, pushing the tally to more than 152,000. In Pakistan, the virus has killed seven more people, with the death toll rising to 6,600. 21. Globally, the virus has infected nearly 39 million people with 1.09 million deaths. Those are the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Azerbaijan has accused the Armenian army of deliberately targeting children and educational institutions. The Azeri Foreign Ministry has called on the international community to pursue Armenia to stop such actions. It said the continuation of the targeted attacks demonstrates the racist and xenophobic policy of Armenia. Baku also urged the international community to refrain from giving political, financial and military support to Armenia. It says such actions contribute to the grave violations committed by Armenia against the children in the Republic of Azerbaijan. Nearly 600 people have been killed since fighting broke out in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region on September the 27th. The Taliban claim they have captured multiple Afghan military posts in northeastern Badakhshan province. Spokesperson Zabiu Ola Mujahid said all posts in Pachak and Hawasa areas of a Doj district are now under Taliban's control. He said the group killed 13 soldiers and wounded 10 others while capturing the areas. The spokesperson said two Taliban were also killed. Earlier, the Taliban said they overran an Afghan military base in Dilaram district of southwestern Nimroz province. Kabul has not yet commented on the Taliban's claims. Major European powers, including France and the UK, have condemned Israeli plans to build nearly 5,000 settler homes in the occupied West Bank. In a joint statement, they said Israel's expansionist agenda violates international law and further imperils the viability of a two-state solution. Earlier this week, Israel approved over 1,300 new settler homes in the West Bank, with more in the pipeline. This comes at a time when the U.S. is pushing more Arab countries to normalize ties with Israel after the UAE and Bahrain. In Malaysia, former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad and his allies have filed a total of five no-confidence motions against Prime Minister Mohyuddin Yassin. At present, the Prime Minister has the support of 113 MPs in the 222-member House. His government will collapse with the defection of only three MPs. This comes after opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim met King al Sultan Abdullah in a bid to prove he has a parliamentary majority to form a government. 
but police summoned Ibrahim to assist a probe into complaints over a list of 121 lawmakers backing his bid for the premiership. The king has called on the politicians to resolve issues through negotiations and constitutional means. In Thailand, thousands of anti-government protesters have defied a government ban on demonstrations for the second day in a row. They are demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Padyut Chan Ocha and a reduction in the king's power. But the Prime Minister refuses to budge on their demands, saying the emergency measures are here to stay for another 30 days. Anti-government protests emerged last year after a court banned the party opposing the government of Padyut Chan Ocha. Thailand's royal family is shielded from criticism by a strict law that carries a sentence of up to 15 years. But this time, a student-led protest movement has succeeded to ruffle the feathers of the royal family. China and Thailand have agreed to create fast tracks and green lanes to facilitate the flow of people and goods. The Prime Minister Padyut Chan Ocha and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi reached the deal in Bangkok. Padyut Chan Ocha said Thailand and China should formulate plans together for their post COVID 19 cooperation. He said Bangkok expects more Chinese enterprises to invest in Thailand. He promised to provide an open, fair, and transparent business environment for Chinese enterprises. For his part, Wong pointed out the two sides should strengthen COVID 19 vaccine cooperation. He added, the two countries should advance the joint construction of the Belt and Road. The foreign minister also called for speeding up the building of the China-Thailand high-speed railway. Thailand was the last leg of Wong's Five Nations Southeast Asia tour. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson says his country has to get ready for a no-deal Brexit on the 1st of January. In a televised address, Johnson said the EU is not serious in negotiations over a post-Brexit economic partnership. The EU Council said it's disappointed by the lack of progress in talks, but it's still determined to get the deal done. Both the sides are calling on each other to compromise on key issues including fishing and limits on the government subsidies to businesses. If a deal is not done by the end of this year, the UK will trade with the EU according to the default rules set by the World Trade Organization. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has called for an extension of an arms control treaty with the United States for at least one more year. Signed in 2010, the New START treaty limits the numbers of strategic nuclear weapons that Russia and the United States can deploy. The treaty is set to expire in February, but Moscow has repeatedly urged Washington to avoid delays in prolonging the treaty to avoid an arms race. It would be very regrettable if the treaty disappeared and was not replaced by another similar fundamental document. In the past, the New START treaty worked. It worked well, fulfilling its fundamental role as a constraint, curbing the arms race and controlling weapons. It's clear we have new weapon systems that the Americans don't have, for the moment in any case. We're open to discuss this issue as well. In the United States, authorities have detained Mexico's former defense minister, Salvador Suifoigos, for his alleged involvement in drug trafficking. Suifoigos was reportedly on a trip with his family when he was arrested at Los Angeles airport. He has been Mexico's defense chief between 2012 and 2018. Sion Fuegos was a powerful figure in Mexico's drug war in which the army battled cartels across the country. Several of Mexico's former top-ranking drug war officials have been implicated in narcotics. Iraq says it will coordinate with the U.S. to develop a timeline for the withdrawal of the American troops from the country. Iraq's foreign ministry said it has formed a technical committee to oversee the redeployment of forces outside Iraq. It said the meeting in Baghdad included Iraq's foreign minister, national security advisor, and other security officials. The establishment of the body follows a series of meetings between the U.S. and Iraqi officials over the summer. Earlier this year, the Iraqi parliament voted to expel all the foreign forces after a U.S. airstrike killed Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad. 
The U.S. says it has killed two senior al-Qaeda operatives in a drone strike near Idlib in northwest Syria. In an interview, the U.S. Central Command spokesperson said the strike was carried out by the military's elite Joint Special Operations Command. Major Beth Riordan mentioned al-Qaeda's Syrian branch continues to threaten the U.S. interests and allies. It is the first drone strike by the U.S. military against al-Qaeda in Syria since September. In Libya, the rival political factions have agreed to end the transitional political period and Moldova how to form a government. The UN support mission in Libya said the agreement was reached after three days of constitutional talks in Cairo, Egypt. It mentioned the two sides also agreed to maintain talks to reach a permanent solution to the crisis. The mission said it hopes the decision will pave the way for Libya's political settlement and facilitate the Political Dialogue Forum. The GNA's Libyan High Council and East-based Tabruk Parliament have been trying to thrash out a power-sharing deal. The two sides have already agreed on which positions to share in the key institutions of the country. India has recorded more than 63,000 COVID-19 infections in the last 24 hours, with a tally crossing 7.3 million. 895 deaths were registered across the country in a day, with a toll crossing 112,000. Meanwhile, Brazil has recorded over 700 coronavirus deaths in the last 24 hours, pushing the tally to more than 152,000. Globally, the virus has infected nearly 39 million people, with 1.09 million deaths. More in this report. COVID-19 pandemic has stormed back into Europe, forcing many places to reimpose tough restrictions eased just months ago. In Germany, the healthcare system of Bavaria state is overwhelmed as it struggles with a rapid surge in infections. New cases in France are multiplying by the thousands as the country struggles to avoid a national lockdown. The World Health Organization has urged Europe to step up efforts as the COVID-19 becomes the fifth leading cause of death on the continent. The evolving epidemiological situation in Europe raises great concern. Daily numbers of cases are up, hospital admissions are up, and COVID is now the fifth leading cause of deaths, and the bar of 8,000 deaths per day has now been reached. In Latin America, COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc as economic strife has forced people to return to work. Meanwhile, U.S. President continues to stand firm on his decision not to implement a lockdown despite cases now surging in majority of the states. Over in Japan, the government is set to experiment new innovative antivirus measures in country sports stadiums to curb the spread. After being able to accept spectators, we have done various anti-coronavirus measures that we hadn't done before. We have proposed a new cheering style, which is to cheer without shouting, as well as disinfectants of seats and distribution of alcohol wipes. Russia has also reported record high single-day deaths in the last 24 hours. In the meantime, China reported no locally transmitted cases, while 24 imported cases were identified. In Pakistan, seven more people have lost their lives to COVID-19 during the last 24 hours. The health ministry says the countrywide death toll has risen to 6,621. The ministry says 651 people tested positive overnight. It said there are 9,421 active COVID-19 cases in the country. The ministry added, out of nearly 322,000 cases, over 305,000 have recovered so far. It said more than 141,000 cases have been detected in the southern province of Sindh, while in Punjab, 101,000 cases have been reported. Well, so, is to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The death toll from floods in India's southern states has jumped to 77. Police say many others are still missing. Chief Minister of the Worst Affected Telangana State, Chandra Shekhar Rao, says the floods have damaged property and crops worth around $70 million in the state. Officials say the situation in the state of Karnataka worsened with the rains and the release of water from major dams. The Indian Med Department has forecast heavy rains in Maharashtra and western coastline Konkan in the next two days. 
Air quality in India's capital New Delhi is continuously deteriorating. The wind has died down just as the burning of crop waste in fields sent smoke billowing across the north of the country. A thick blanket of smog has reduced visibility in the area as the air quality index dropped to the very unhealthy category at 259. What in this report? Up until September, New Delhi and its surrounding cities had enjoyed a breathing space due to the strict COVID-19 lockdown. But now, smoke from an assortment of different pollutants has made it difficult for residents to breathe. The city's early risers have complained of not just breathing issues, but irritation in the eyes as well. Ah, actually, um... Yes, actually, we usually come here in the morning, so we get to see the sunrise. But when we came today, there was a lot of smog. So we realize the pollution level is high over here, because of which we are facing a little difficulty in breathing while we were cycling. Usually we try to maintain average speed, but today the pollution is more and we were facing difficulty in putting pressure while breathing. Every winter, a thick blanket of smog settles over northern India as a combination of factors brings a spike in pollution. Illegal crop burning in farm states, vehicle exhaust and swirling construction dust contribute to what has become an annual crisis. Pollution level in Delhi was normal 20 days ago, but since the stubble is being burned in Punjab and Haryana, that has caused even more pollution and we are feeling suffocated. It has become difficult to come out. Earlier, we used to roam around comfortably, but today there is pain in my eyes and we are facing breathing difficulty. Last year, New Delhi and neighboring cities accounted for half of dozen most polluted cities worldwide. It seems this year will be no different and Delhi residents have tough few months ahead of them. Scorching temperatures made September 2020 the hottest on a record. Scientists say there is a 65% chance this year might end up as the warmest. More in this report. Blazing temperatures contributed 2020 being a remarkably hot year. Siberia, Middle East and South America recorded unusually high temperatures. Climatologists at the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration say this was the warmest September since records began in 1880, with a mean temperature increase of 0.97 degrees Celsius above the 20th century average. Um, average as a whole, this was the warmest September on record with a temperature a departure from average of 0.97 degrees Celsius or 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average. Um, the last, the 10 warmest Septembers that we've seen um, have occurred since 2005. However, the seven warmest have occurred in the last seven years. This year, extreme weather played a major role in disasters, including fires in California and the Arctic to floods in Asia. A small change in the mean of the global temperature can lead to big changes in extreme, extreme weather. And so what we're seeing right now is that we do expect for heat waves to become more frequent, more intense, and we're already seeing that um, in terms of drought as well. Um, the general rule of thumb is that areas that are dry will get drier and areas that are wet will get wetter. In 2015, countries agreed under the Paris Climate Accord to attempt to cap warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Large emitters, including China and the EU, have pledged to slash their emissions in the coming decades. But current policies will see temperatures rise far beyond the 1.5 degree level. Iran is reeling through U.S. sanctions for quite a while, forcing it to sell oil on cheaper rates in the grey market. The country is now looking at renewable energy to help its struggling economy with solar panels propping up in different cities. The government is also encouraging alternative modes of electricity to lessen the burden on national grids. This report has the details. Shifting from conventional methods of getting energy, Iran is turning to solar panel farms. The local media said the eastern province of Kerman is one of the regions having large potential for renewable energy production. The energy ministry has also come up with a new scheme called Each Rooftop a Power Plant. Iran is the second most sunlit country in the world and because of having good sunlight, in 365 days of the year we have the sun and four hours during a day we have optimum sunlight, which ranks second in the world. Iran's electricity distribution organization also introduced a system to help Tehran residents save on power costs. 
Under the current economic circumstances in the country, with inflation and the big shifts in foreign exchange rates, the pace of installation and the adoption of solar energy has been slower than expected. But we are optimistic that we can expand these energy stations. In certain areas of Iran, the sun shines 300 days a year, making those regions well suited for producing solar energy. The change in culture and the shift to making use of clean energy sources is a good step for the country. Not only will it limit the harm to the environment, but it will also give a boost to the struggling economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused a lot of damage and disturbed daily life across the world. But a group of Filipino teachers has found a creative way to help children living in remote mountains catch up on their studies. This report has more. Authorities in the Philippines have ordered all school classes to be held online until a coronavirus vaccine is available. Because of this, indigenous ETA students have been left out of the program as their isolated village lacked the infrastructure to take part in online learning. Nonetheless, a group of teachers decided to take the matter into their own hands. Using old bookshelves and wooden boards, they built a makeshift learning center complete with a large monitor. We teachers initially had a hard time because the only option given by the government was online or blended learning where students are given modules and continue their lessons virtually. However, there is no internet or television in this area. We had to think of an alternative way to bring the lessons to the children. A setup can fit on top of a rickshaw and travel between rugged mountain village routes in the mostly rural province of Pampanga. The teachers pre-recorded instructional videos using their mobile phones and played them to assist students while avoiding face-to-face -face contact. There is no extra budget allocated for the project, although the rickshaw and driver were provided by the local government. Sir, Some of our ITA students cannot read, especially the kindergarten and the elementary students. So how are they going to be able to answer the module? Even their parents cannot assist them. The only solution is through our innovation. The teachers say students have responded enthusiastically to the courses, with parents grateful for the resumption in classes. In Romania, a cliff diving pair has dived 120 meters underground in one of the world's oldest salt mines. In a never-done-before feat, the athletes leap from the walls of the cone-shaped mining room into the high salinity lake. What in this report? This visually stunning area has the oldest Turda salt mine. The astounding beauty has made the place like a wonderland, shaped by salt and humankind. Cliff diving champion Rhiannon Eflin and local star Konstantin Popovici took up the challenge to jump into a lake inside the salt mine. There's a lot of challenges diving here. Um, well, firstly, it's it's a brand new location. It's very dark um, down in the lake. Uh, the water is 17% more dense than seawater, so the impact is is different. It's actually quite a unique experience to hit the water. Um, when it's that salty, it, uh, it just pushes you straight up to the surface. So that's also a challenge. You know, we came here not knowing um, how that would feel and, and how the body would take the, the impact with the different water. Cliff diver Konstantin Popovici Ooh. has called it a new and different experience. The big challenge, I would say, it's, uh, it's the salinity. It's super salty um, compared to a normal ocean, uh, which it makes uh, it makes it more uh, tough on your body on the impact. Um, also, being in a cave, it's totally dark. Uh, we have lights, but it's still not a natural, uh, uh, perfect condition to dive. Uh, so that's another challenging thing. In 2013, Salinda Turda was converted into a museum having an underground theme park. This place attracts 700,000 visitors every year. Well, so is to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned.
European markets have gained looking to bounce back from steep losses yesterday amid looming lockdowns due to surging COVID-19 cases. European stock 600 has gained close to 1% with autos jumping over 2%. London's FTSE 100 too has gained nearly 1%. In Italy, the FTSE MIB has added close to half a percent. The CAC 14 Paris has climbed well over 1%, while Frankfurt's DAX too edged up half a percent. Earlier, most Asian stocks traded mixed with Japanese, South Korean and Australian bourses declining. In tennis, Spain's Roberto Bautista Augert has defeated French veteran Gilles Simon in straight sets at the Bet One Hulks Indoors in Cologne. Augert beats Simon 6 4 and 7 6 to advance to the tournament's quarterfinals, where he will face Hubert Hokac of Poland. In the other matches, Canadian Felix Augert Eliassimi east past Henry Luxnonen 6 4 and 6 1. In a major upset, Croatia's Medin Cilic was sent backing by Spaniard Alejandro Davidovic for Kena 3-6-7-6 and 6-2. In cycling, Ecuador's Jonathan Narvaez has won the 12th stage of the Giro d'Italia. Ukraine's Mark Padon finished second, followed by Australia's Simon Clark. Portugal's Joao Mida retained his pink jersey with a slim lead over Dutch Manuel Kaldeman. Spain's Apello Bellao is third in the overall standings ahead of Italy's Domenico Posivivo. The next stage is a flat 192-kilometer route from Cervia to Montsellice. In cricket, Southern Punjab beat Sin by 70 runs in the 28th match of the National T20 Cup in Pakistan. After being put into bat first, Southern Punjab scored 191 runs in the 20 overs. Suhaib Maksud and Khushdil Shah scored half centuries to help their side post a huge total. In reply, Sin struggled from the start and were all out for 121 runs. Khura Manzu scored 49, while Muhammad Ilyas and Zahid Mahmood took three wickets each. Earlier, Northern beat Baluchistan with 39 runs at Rawal Pindi. Another weather situation from around the globe. That is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.